allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Raymond Weeks, 
a World War II veteran organized National Veterans Day, which included a parade and other festivities to honor all veterans. The event was held on November 11th, then designated Armistice Day. Later, U.S. Representative Edward Reese of Kansas proposed a bill that would change Armistice Day to Veterans Day. In 1954, Congress passed the bill that President Eisenhower signed for planning November 11th as Veterans Day. Raymond Weeks received the Presidential Citizens Medal from President Reagan in November 1982. Weeks' local parade and ceremonies are now an annual event celebrated nationwide.
As the nation braced itself for the final throes of the Civil War, thousands of spectators gathered on a muddy Pennsylvania Avenue near the U.S. Capitol to hear President Lincoln's second inaugural address. It was March 4, 1865, a time of great uneasiness. In just over one month, the war would end and the president would be assassinated. President Lincoln framed his speech on the moral and religious implications of the war rhetorically questioning how a just God could unleash such a terrible war upon the nation. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses in the providence of God, and that he gives to both north and south this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offenses came. With its philosophical insights, critics have hailed the speech as one of Lincoln's best. As the speech progressed, President Lincoln turned from the divisive bitterness at the war's roots to the unifying task of reconciliation and construction. In the speech's final paragraph, the President delivered his pres prescription for the nation's recovery. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves with all nations. With the words to care for him who shall have borne the battle for his widow and his orphan, President Lincoln affirmed the government's obligation to care for those injured during the war and to provide for the families of those who perished on the battlefield. Today, a pair of metal plaques bearing those words flank the entrance to the Washington, D.C. headquarters of the Department of Veterans Affairs. The VA is the federal agency responsible for serving the needs of veterans by providing health care, disability compensation and re rehabilitation, education assistance, home loans, burial in the National Cemetery, and other benefits and services. President Lincoln's words have stood the test of time and stand today as a solemn reminder of the VA's commitment to care for those injured in our nation's defense and the family of those killed in its service.
The memorial was a welcome sight for America's World War II veterans. But sadly, of the 16 million men and women who served our nation during World War II, approximately 855,000 are alive today. For some of these veterans, traveling to Washington, D.C. to visit their memorial is no easy feat. When Mr. Earl Morris, the physician assistant for the Department of Veteran Affairs and retired Air Force captain living in Springfield, Ohio, learned that the veterans in his community were financially and physically unable to visit the memorial, he decided to do something about it. He formed the Honor Flight, a network of pilots who volunteered to fly to the World War II Veterans Memorial to Washington, D.C., free of charge to visit their memorial. That first year, 2005, Morris and his Honor Flight Network flew 137 veterans to Washington, D.C. As word spread, the program exploded, according to Morris, who began receiving more than 100 applications a month. Other communities began their own efforts. In 2006, in Hendersonville, North Carolina, Mr. Jeff Miller arranged for a commercial jet to fly local veterans to the memorial. Miller shared his story with others, and by the end of 2006, 891 World War II veterans across America were able to visit the memorial. In 2008, Southwest Airlines became an honor flight sponsor. That year, more than 11,000 World War II vets got the opportunity to visit their memorial. And in 2009, that figure jumped to 17,000. Today, the mission of the Honor Flight Network continues to grow. There are more than currently over 21,000 veterans on the Honor Flight waiting list who served in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. 23,400 veterans flown in 2019 and 801 and 500 since 2005. There are more than 130 Honor Flight hubs we're operating in 42 states that flew 20,886 veterans to Washington, D.C. in 2015. For more information or participate in the honor flight or make a donation, please visit www.honorflight.org.
On Veterans Day, they think of the men and women who march in VFW parades. They think of their grandfathers, the great generous World War II sailors, eager to share sea stories. And their uncles, stoic Vietnam era airmen, reluctant to talk about the war. They think of the aunt who served in the Persian Gulf and the neighbor's son who recently shipped off to Afghanistan. They think of us when they see us in airport terminals, young soldiers and Marines giving our teary-eyed parents a welcome home embrace as we return from recruit training. They think of us when they see us on the airport tarmacs, older soldiers and Marines kissing our runny-nosed kids goodbye as we leave their missions of peacekeeping or war -making. They think of us as we are in movies, marching off to war with soiled resolve and assaulting beachheads with quiet determination. They think of us aligned on parade grounds, weapons and uniforms sparkling in the sun, posturing very picture discipline. They think that military service is about combat and heroism and uncommon acts of battle. But there are things a veteran knows. We know that few of us ever saw battle and that we're mostly ordinary people who perform common duties. We know that our service, whether three years or 30, was mainly composed of discrete units of battle or boring routine that the drudgery of time spent cleaning rifles, equipment, or barracks, and preparation for inspections, interviews, and formations in which we'd spend hours standing around Rod Street while trying to hide bubbly knees and sweat drenched necks, and the maddening urge to scratch skin that itched more and more the longer we stood still. We know that service is about our willingness, willingness to endure shin splits and blistered feet from too many miles of marching and running. We know it was about doing sit-ups on wet beaches on mornings that were too cold and became much too early. We know it was about our ability to endure our own incessant whining as we made an advocation of complaining about being tired, wet, cold, and sore. And we know about enduring the failings and weaknesses that were exposed when we discovered the limits of our endurance. We know that service requires loving our home so much that we willingly give up all that we cherish, our freedom, our youth, our life, so that others may be safe. We know that in serving our homeland, we gave up our ability to watch over our own homes. We know that in leaving our families for far off lands and seas, and that no matter how many cards and letters and pictures and videos our family would send, that it can never replace the time we miss being with our children, watching over them, letting them know we were there to protect them. We know Veterans Day is about the men and women being born served alongside, the voluble young Marines always eager to talk about their kids, the reverent old soldier who led prayer in chapel. We still think of them from time to time, though always on Veterans Day. And when we meet our fellow veterans, we always know exactly what we need when we pat their back and take their hand and say thank you for your service. All stand.
as the battlefield has allowed all of us here to enjoy a way of life that is unique. We have freedoms established by our founding fathers, men like George Washington, the father of our country, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and James Madison, the father of our Constitution, just to name a few. These freedoms continue today because of the men and women in uniform who protect this nation every single day. Up next, Zach McKinney. Chief of Police of Crystal City Police Department. 
and then he was elected the sheriff of Jefferson County for over 24 years. He is a graduate of the FBI National Academy and the FBI Advanced Leadership Course, the Secret Service Dignitary Protection Program for senior executives, and during his time in law enforcement, he has received numerous awards, including the Gateway Crime Commission Medal of Valor, the American Legion Police Officer of the Year, the Missouri Department of Deputy Sheriff's Association Sheriff of the Year, and many, many others. He was appointed to several boards and commissions, including the Missouri Veterans Commission, Missouri Public Service Commission, and was appointed to the Presidential Medal of Honor Commission as a charter member. He is a life member of the Crystal City VFW Post, the DeSoto Ambeds, and a member of the Festus American Legion Post. During his retirement, he enjoys his family, traveling, hunting, and fishing. And he is very proud of his grandson, Chase, who recently entered with the United States Marine Corps. Students and staff of Festus Intermediate, let's please give our highest honor and respect for Mr. Glenn Boyer. We have created and mourned 
celebrated and mourned. We've lost a few along the way. When our adventure was over, some of us went back home. <clears throat> some of us started somewhere new, and some of us never came home at all. We've told amazing and hilarious stories of our exploits and adventures. We share an unspoken bond with each other that most people don't experience, and very few will understand. We speak highly of our own branch. <clears throat> Excuse me. We speak highly of our own branch of service and poke fun at the other branches. I'm talking about all you Marines out there. We know, however, that if we that if needed, we will be there for our brothers and our sisters and stand together as one, and we'll do it in a heartbeat. Being a veteran is something that we had that had to be earned and it can never be taken away. It has had no monetary value, but at the same time, it's a priceless gift. People see a veteran and they thank them for their service. When we see each other, we give them a little upwards head nod, a grin, a slight smile, knowing that we have shared and experienced things that most people have not. So for myself and the rest of the veterans out there, I commend and I thank you for all that you have done and sacrificed for our country. Try to remember the good times. Make peace with the bad. Share your stories. But most importantly, stand tall and proud for you have earned the right to be called a vet. And I thank you. with us today. Let's give him another
Thank you. At this time, I would like to bring your attention to our honor choir under the direction of Mr. Joshua Ryan. They will be singing God Bless America.
Thank you, everyone. And that concludes our 15th Veterans Day Assembly. We especially would like to thank all the veterans that are watching with us today in our live stream. And have a great day celebrating your freedom today.